Uh, thank you for coming in a little bit closer. Uh, what an amazing difference this energy will make. So thank you for sitting at one of these upper tables here and being close to me so I can see you and, and be uh, make sure you're part of this. We are excited about all that we have to go. I want to introduce you to Cindy Mood. She's our director of Just About Everything Awesome. Uh, and uh, uh, so she's going to help us do something really cool that we can do tonight. Uh, we are able now to check in through our app. And so, Cindy, would you help us uh, learn how to check in our presence through the app and then uh, give us a little blessing? I would love to. So who has their smartphone? If you do, get it out. If you have the app downloaded, I would love for you to find that app and open it up. If you don't have it downloaded, all of these instructions are going to be going out in the next email. So don't worry. You'll have another opportunity. Also, yes, we have kinks in the app, but we're working through them. Change is exciting and it's going to be good. So once you're in the app, then it's going to give you an option to Wednesday at MDUMC. It's a nice banner. And you're going to click on it. And it's going to give you yourself, your family, whoever is in your household. And you're going to find Dr. Morgan's Wednesday Bible study. And you're going to click that. It's going to change the circle to a blue circle check mark. Then you're going to make sure you press next. And that can go to the next slide. Maybe. Right. Yep. Okay. That's okay. Because this is, we're all learning together. And if you have problems, then I will be here to help you. Um, and we might not get it all worked out before Brad talks, so that's okay. I'm also available by email, phone, and in the office. So if you have gotten to that and it shows you something, you can check in by pressing next. You might have to authenticate your identity. That's to protect your financial giving information. And then, voila, you are checked in. We are still working out the kinks, and I will work with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And would you offer us a blessing? Oh, yes. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather, to learn about your love for us and between people and how we can love you deeper. We ask that you would be blessing us with this fruitful conversation and just make the words of Brad's mouth be the meditation of all of our hearts. All this we ask in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Cindy. Beautiful prayer. And uh, friends, we're so blessed to have Cindy Mood uh, on board with us and working with us. Uh, she's truly terrific. And uh, we'll be helping you as as we kind of go to, to work through some things. I also wanted to give you just a little bit, a couple of announcements. Uh, you may or may not have already met uh, Reverend Jennifer Grow, uh, a new associate pastor on staff here. Uh, she was introduced last Sunday. Um, uh, her grandbaby came a little bit uh, early, and so that kind of disrupted the normal flow of things. But it's great; everybody's healthy, happy, beautiful baby. She was very happy to get time with her her grandbaby. But um, instead of last Sunday when we thought she's going to preach, she's going to preach this Sunday, and so she'll be there. Uh, you'll want to be there to welcome her and uh, be a part of her coming to MDUMC. We're very excited about that. Um, additionally, I wanted to remind you about the the Holy Land uh, trip, uh, kind of. Coming up, uh, we do have that opportunity. Several people have asked me. It's not too late to sign up, uh, but we are trying to get final head counts uh, on that. So if that's something that interests you, the link is there on the website and want to encourage you to take a moment uh, to, to look at that. Well, um, today I, I want to, first of all, just welcome you. I cannot tell you how excited I am uh, to be back with you, to get things going, and also, too, to jump into this topic. Uh, it's an exciting topic to look at the love stories of the Bible. Um, in the welcome, too, I wanted to show you something here. Friends, I got you flowers. Every one of you deserve flowers. But I know some of you feel like you've had a week or a time or a season where you don't feel worthy of a flower, where you need a reminder that God loves you and something to hold on to, to remind you of God's love. So after we're done, these flowers will be here. If somebody wants to help me with the check for next week so I can get 100 flowers and have one for everybody, please do. 
I'd happily accept that gift. But for those who need them, if you need something to hold on to and take with you to remind you that you are loved by God, don't leave here without taking one of the flowers. And you, you know who you are. And um, they're for you, okay? Um, don't forget we love you. And don't forget you're not alone in whatever you're going through, okay? It's important. The purpose of our time together is to remind you how loved you are by God and to strengthen your faith. But as we read through some of the stories, I'm going to read really close in on the text, and I'm going to show you some of what the Bible says. And sometimes when you read what the Bible actually says, you find out that what Grandma told you wasn't exactly right. What you learned in Sunday school as a child may be different than how the Bible actually reads. And I just want to warn you that to me, the most important thing is building your faith. So if something I says troubles your soul or makes you feel like anything about your faith is being shaken because I present to you something that is different than what you grew up on, it's okay. It's, it's, it, I will point out, if I think it's important for salvation, I'll let you know that. But short of that, lots of people have lots of opinions about the Bible, and it's okay. Don't lose your faith. Don't let anything I say take you away from faith. I want to build up your faith and help you have a faith. For me, I'm going to have to base my faith on a close reading of the Bible in its original languages and listen to what the text actually says deeply, okay? So that's where I'm going to go. But just let you know, I'm going to give you a roadmap to what I hope is a stronger understanding of faith. But what I won't do is kind of, kind of get you in a place where if you start feeling like, oh, Pastor Brad, like you say this thing here and I don't, it's, it's okay you don't agree with that. It's okay. I'm not asking you to agree with anything I say. I am asking you to know and understand the love of God and that from the very beginning, Throughout the whole book of the Bible, from the Genesis all the way through Revelation and every part in between, God is trying to communicate a story of love for you. The number one challenge I have when I have people in settings that they come to me and meet with me in my office is there are a lot of people in this world who do not realize how much God loves them. And nothing could break my heart open more than that. So please, again, do not leave here without the love of God alive in your heart. We're going to read the, oh, sorry, go to slide three. We're going to read the Bible study with you, kind of read these stories with me. Um, I want you to know I'm going to go for about 45 to 50 minutes, those of you who are new. Uh, in fact, I have choir members who in <laughs> at 10 till will stand up and need to walk out. They're not walking out in protest. So if I say something just inadvertently provocative in that moment, just know uh, that's not why they're walking out. They're walking out to that. Also, too, you're all adults. If you have children's things or appointments or need to go to the bathroom or that thing, you're not going to bother me. I'm going to assume you're happy with everything going on unless you come to me, pull me aside or make office time and say, Brad, I'm upset about this, okay? But at the end, I'll stay and answer questions. Um, this morning, they, got, they were kind of eager for the questions. We went a little bit long, about 45 minutes after. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to, I'm gonna, I'll stop a little bit early. I'll go till about half past the hour if people stay. I'll, I'll do about 20 minutes of question answering like this and, and repeating those questions for those on Zoom. Um, in fact, I'm going to actually, we're going to try with the microphone for questions to see if the people on Zoom can hear the question asker. And then um, what I'll try to do is then um, after that, though, I'll also, for those in the room, uh, I'll move aside because sometimes people don't like to ask questions where everyone else can hear them. And so I'll, I'll be able to answer private questions if you have those. You can also always email me, uh, bradmorgan at mdumc.org. You can get that on our website. Uh, you can send those questions to me or other things, and I'll get to them as quick as I can. You're going to love this, and you can all applaud right now. No homework. Yay! Um, that means you have no excuse for not being here. 
Okay, uh, you can show up and just listen and be be along for the ride. It's it's great. Uh, there is there is no homework for this. I, I do expect you to to come be part of this and, and bless. Tell your friends, get them involved. But if you have to miss, you know we have things. Life happens even on Wednesday nights. Um, we also get these up pretty quick on our YouTube channel and at mdumc.org/study you're able to follow along if you have to miss one. You can also, if you're ever out of town or in another place, uh, join us via Zoom, okay? So I want you to keep engaged. Um, we will have something to reflect on though every week. So don't be surprised if during the week after our time together, you find yourself thinking about things we say or talk about tonight. So I'm ready to go, I'm ready to jump in. I got all my clearing house. Did I say welcome? I'm so glad you're here and ready to go. All right, let's take a look at slide four. What is a biblical love story? I mean, did anybody think it's awkward? I'm talking about love stories in the Bible, kind of an interesting theme. Uh, we're gonna kind of walk through this, but I, I just went back and looked at two sources. Uh, the Merriam Dictionary, you know, Merriam-Webster has a dictionary, if you haven't heard of it, that they do. And there's also an Oxford English Dictionary uh, that's pretty good. And it's simply uh, a tale of lovers. Okay, a tale of lovers, two people who love each other. Um, the first reference was all the way back in 1594. So we've said the word love story way before the movie in the 70s that said love never means saying to after. Y'all know it. See, oh, y'all have heard of that, right? So that kind of idea of, of what a love story is. Um, you know, why we're going to talk about it in this way is because the love of God does woo us. It does attract us. It does pull us to, uh, to God. But what I want to point out to you is that in our discussion of a biblical love story, what I'm going to be focused on are three things that I want you to know. We're going to talk about the tale about God. It's a tale about us as human beings. In almost all of these, the characters in them represent all of humanity, and it's a tale about the relationship between us and God. So always, in all that we're going to talk about, you're going to ask me questions, and you're going to ask me questions about science, and questions about philosophy, questions about astrophysics, and nuclear science, and what am I going to do? I'm going to say, well, that's interesting. But let's talk about God, let's talk about us, and let's talk about the relationship between God and us, okay? In some of the stories, the us is going to involve relationship with two peoples. Um, some of them are salacious. They're going to make your ears tingle. Have you ever heard of Delilah? Oh, it's going to get bad. Samson's going to be in trouble, boy. Let me tell you that, okay? There are going to be others that you're like, huh, Brad, what do you mean by that? You're like, that's why did you pick them? But I'll show you. It's okay. Read it with me. Good things will happen along the way. And then also, I want to show you how the two love stories that are at the beginning of our Bibles form the foundation for everything else. And I want to show you that the very love of God is in creation itself from the beginning. And so tonight we're going to start there and kind of work our way off. So I was thinking about love stories, and one of my favorite love stories, they, they're now making a third one, I think, this year. Um, anybody heard of a, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Anybody remember that movie? Right, I mean, it's a great movie. It really taps in to what it is to be kind of an American, that all of us are in families that kind of came to a place that we all feel kind of awkward. We go and we meet peers and people of other places and we don't feel like we fit in. And we feel like our family is just weird and crazy and from another planet. And this woman goes through a process of learning that actually the love of her family has made her who she is and blessed her to be a person that could be available to another person as she falls in love with the most blanded white guy you ever met, who's absolutely not Greek, right? And, th and they all come together. But it's such a beautiful story because all of us as, as a people who are American can kind of identify with parts of the discomfort of this bringing together of all these different 
cultures and have navigated parts of that. And so it's, it's a beautiful story, so I love it. And it brings me to the most uncomfortable part of the talk for me, and that is, how many of you have heard a story on love in the Bible that the preacher walks you through the four Greek words for love? You ever heard one of those? Right, let's go to the next slide. And they're gonna bring you to these words here. They're big, fat, Greek, let me show you how smart I am and how dumb you are. Uh, like it's kind of a weird kind of way of getting into it. And they talk about the Greek language and the words for love and how they're used and they break down all four so you need to kind of know them or something to be able to read the Bible. That's just silly. Our, our word for love has lots of different meanings. I, I can understand why somebody goes into a nuance of it, but the words up here that we have as the first one is eros. And eros is what it sounds like. It means erotic love, but it means a physical love between two people. And the thing with eros that's a little bit different than the way erotic is, is when we say erotic, you think, bad, there's something, something going on that needs to be behind closed doors or barred or in a red light district or a bad part of Amsterdam, right? I mean, like, like it's, it's something... It's something that there's bad. There's none of that baggage in Greek. Uh, Eros doesn't have any sort of, uh, you know, shame with it in the Greek language. Uh, so it's, it's not quite like it. Um, the concept of uh, Eros love, that Greek type of love, of love between two people is found in the Old and New Testament. It, it's there. You can find it in the Old Testament. Probably the, the best example is, uh, you know, in the Song of Solomon, you have this young man who, her eyes are so beautiful and her hair is so great. And she, I long for her with all my soul, the way I long for God, right? I mean, it's it's just like, yeah, yeah, that's Eros, right? I mean, that's, that's kind of physical pining love. Um, you later will have in Paul's writing, uh, reference to Eros, where he'll kind of talk about if people can't live as I do and stay chaste because the burning in their body requires them to do something about it, make sure they get married, right? I mean, like, th these are two th examples. But the word Eros that often gets thrown in this list of four Greek words about love actually isn't in the Bible. It's only one of the three not there. I want to take you to Philia. This is probably the one you're most familiar with. You know very well, right? Because what city in America sounds like that? The city of? Yeah, that's right. And um, it's, it's a kind of a, a love that's brotherly in nature. But the thing that's difficult for us is when we think of brotherly, I think of sibling love, of an immediate sibling. But when the Greeks talk about brotherly, they mean anyone who was in the phalanx with them, anyone who was in the army group with them that was by city and tribe. And remember that at that time, the cities were more like little tribes with a place. And so everybody's related to everybody else. It's kind of like small town Texas, right? And everybody's everybody else's cousin. And when it's, they say brotherly love, or filial, you know, love here. It is a love for everybody in your kinship group, not just your immediate brother or sister. It can mean that, but it tends to be a little bit broader, okay? And again, friends, remind, reminder, all I'm doing right now is I'm setting your table. You're gonna need this silverware in China later in the course, okay? And so here we go. Storge is kind of interesting. And that it's a familial love. And oh, I didn't tell you where philia is in the Bible. Have anybody read Ephesians? Colossians, Galatians, any time that Paul is talking about older to kind of younger relations, but specifically family dynamics with brothers, and he says, be brothers and this kind of stuff, he'll almost, uh, he'll use agape sometimes there, but philia gets used a lot. Storge is a little bit different. Um, how many, somebody was telling me about a family reunion. Y'all were telling me about that. And she said hundreds, he said 27 that are there. But it's, uh, you know, it depends if you grew up in it or not, how big you think it is, right? That's how it, how it works. Uh, storge is kind of a family love, but it's not just an immediate nuclear family. It's that kind of larger family kind of thing. But what's interesting about storge is it almost always implies a kind of a generational of a person at a certain status in the family loving another generation. So it's a familial love based on family position okay, that kind of goes between the two. And so there's a lot of um, 
kind of transmission generation to generation in uh, storge love. So likewise, in Paul's writing, when he's going to talk about um, passing on the faith in a way, he's going to use storge as the word for love there, okay? Agape is the one you're probably most familiar with, and agape means that universal love. The King James Version would tr translate it actually not as love, but as charity. It, it's kind of a a love for all humanity. And what it does is, is it focuses us in on how interrelated we are with all other people in the world. So agape isn't for just another person. Agape is a love in your heart that also reflects the kind of connection and creation we have with all other living beings, okay? Agape is pretty important, and you're gonna hear it over and over but you know agape, you've heard agape. Probably the most famous verse about love anywhere in the Bible, if I start reading is, love is patient, love is, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not revo rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Y'all have heard that, right? It's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, the, the whole chapter's worth reading, just bringing that to you. It's very um, kind of important. So as we're looking here at slide seven, uh, we, we can also look at a, another part of this kind of love. Okay, so what kind of love do you think I, that was in 1 Corinthians? Yeah, agape, right? I said it was, right? I gave it away. There's another part here in 1 John uh, chapter 4. Uh, I'll pick up in about verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. I mean, God is love, right? What kind of love would God be? Agape, right? I mean, sorry, spoiler alert, all three of these will be agape, right? I'm just, I'm just hammering the point home. And then, of course, you know John 3.16 and John 3.17, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him right? This is the reminder that God's love is made known in this agape, in this way of loving all creation and all reality. So I just want those kind of in the background music of biblical love for you, and then now we're going to leave my big fat Greek wedding. And I'm going to give you some more flowers on the next slide, slide eight. Okay, and we're going to jump into the first love story in Genesis. And it's not where you think, I'm going to start at the very beginning. In the very beginning here, let's turn over to the left side of our Bibles and go to Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. I mean, amazing, amazing. God pre-existed creation and time. I mean, think about that. What kind of God creates anything? Well, why would God create anything? I mean, I don't know if you've seen how jacked up the world is. Some things are just wrong. As I get older, I'm not sure I like the body I was given. I mean, what's up with that? It's something so simple, I don't want you to miss it because it underlies everything else in this most important verse ever written. God desires to be in relationship with something else. God, God wants to be in relationship which that, with that which is created. God has a desire for us and all of creation 
that's inherent in God's very nature. And so to speak of love and love story, the model for the love stories that we'll be seeing is God's love for that which he created. And time and time again, when it seems creation has gone wrong, when it seems that people have done things to disappoint, when it seems like we've busted away due to the sin of our soul, doing things that we shouldn't, God's creative desire to be in relationship with what he created, his wooing love for us overrides all. And it's right there in the beginning. So we're told that God creates. And then we're told that the earth was formless and empty. And here, it's my favorite words. If you hang out with me for two minutes in sermons, you're going to hear one of my most important parts. I love the words, tohu vabohu. Lisa's laughing because she watches a lot of my sermons there in the media room. She knows. I put these slides up all the time. But tohu vabohu, can you say it with me? Tohu va bohu. It's right there. It means like waste, schmaced, big mess. The only other time that tohu va bohu is in the Bible is when David in 1 Samuel comes up on a battlefield that's in a desert and everything's a desolation and a big mess. And it's tohu va bohu. So what we're told here is that in this watery deep, we're told that the Spirit of God hovers over it and that we're Deep is because the Hebrew word is this like to home. It's, it's not used very common. That's why I don't say ocean or water. They say deep here. It's because it's hovering over the deep. So there you have in this big old waste schmaced world, you have the spirit of God entering that and moving. And I don't know about you, but my life sometimes has felt like a mess. I mean, have you ever been to that place where it seems like all hope is lost and there's nothing but chaos? And God enters that and moves because he desires to be in a creative relationship with that which he has created. He's in a relationship. You see, none of us were born into a void. We weren't just plopped out in a big nothing. We were put in a specific place at a specific time around specific people to be in relationship with the world around us. And that Holy Spirit is there. The exciting movement is when the God's creative act is anticipated, because there is that spirit begins to move. It's right before God will speak and all creation will be organized. So let's go to slide 11. Anybody like the container store? And anybody have a closet they've reorganized more than once? Right, I said we got some guilty, co- yeah, yeah, yeah. You're gonna love God. I was mean, just gonna tell you, God, especially in this first love story, is all about separating things and pulling things apart. And so the first thing he does is he speaks and commands God's creative power on full display, loving the world into existence through the word or logos of God. John, in his beginning of his gospel in the first 14 verses, is going to focus on this part as being the ultimate expression of God's love or wisdom or mind that will be called in Greek the logos of God, the will of God, and that this very will is nothing less than Jesus, okay? So it's it's a beautiful, beautiful understanding of that. So here at this point, what he does in the speaking is the first thing he do does is he separates light and dark. That way, the sun can come up, the sun can come down the first day. Then you move forward to day five, Oh, sorry, day four, day two. And he separates light and darkness. And then after that, he separates the waters above and the waters below, right? Because for the the Hebrew, how did the world work, right? Anybody, well, y'all haven't seen rain in a long time here. Man, (laughs) but um, no, but friends, I've learned don't pray for rain, right? In Houston, Texas, you get a hurricane. So don't don't do that. So if you need to do like a, a little rain dance, do a little rain dance, but keep it small. Okay, no hurricane dances, all right? So let's 
just some, some a little good soaking would be nice okay uh so so that rain but but you see rain coming down from from above now remember uh the holy land's a little bit more rocky and mountainous has a few more geological features and those kind of things so you also see often springs and bubbling water coming up from below right so it, it's logical just observational you see that there's waters above and waters below and so what god does in day two is he separates the waters above from the waters below and then in day three he goes in and again separates remember the container store right he pulls all the land to one place and all the waters to another so now you have dry land and sea and we're told that even on that the grass just started going forward so you get one two three you've got the first right night and day kind of cosmic things day two you have earthly things, the kind of creating of the very above, the in between, and the below. And then day three, you have in the middle, separating the two things out. So one, two, three. What does he do then in day four? In day four, he populates those things to that which gives light and that that brings darkness, the stars and the moon and the sky. Then what he does in day five, is the waters above and the waters below become filled. And then day six, the animals and humankind are created. And then there, I expect in day seven, for God to go back and continue creating. I expect him to keep separating. And instead, here's what we get. So this is chapter two, verse one. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. He does keep separating. He sets apart a day of the week as the Sabbath, but it breaks the pattern of what's gone before, but all of this is in love. I want to go back just a touch, though, before we get too far into that pattern and see part of the population. So on that day six, when he has kind of sorted out the land and now populated it with things, we're told here in verse chapter 1, verse 26, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So people are created and given dominion. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the land, air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I've given you every plant uh, yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth and every tree with it in its fruit. So you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth. And so this kind of creation of humanity but it's kind of interesting. Did you catch that early on there in verse 27? So God created humankind in his image. The image of God, he created them, male and female. Did you catch that? Interesting, interesting. And so next slide. Here in this first love story, we are created in the image of, and likeness in the demut and selim of God, this kind of image and likeness. Now, earlier today, my son John dropped by and I got to have him stand next to me and show everybody he's in my image and likeness. But he's also in Laura's image and likeness too, right? I mean, so he's there. So what does image and likeness mean? It doesn't tell us. I want to know. John Wesley has some thoughts about that and we'll, we can drill down that uh, a little bit later, but male and female, he both created them. But did you hear the charge that comes after that in verse 28? Be fruitful 
and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Literally, to kabosh it. Go kabosh all the earth. Isn't that a great word, kabosh? So, so do this. Take one hand and put it like that, and take the other hand and hit like that. That is to kibosh something, okay? So literally, it is as it sounds, right? It's kibosh, right? Kibosh, kaboom, you know, it's, it's a kibosh thing. So it's interesting that we're told that all is created how? Good, in the image of God, right? And the image of God here is kind of interesting. Um, when we find the body of God, God will look like a human, according to this telling of the story. The image and likeness means we are designed like that. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But the creation is made in a way that God creates them. Why does God create them? Because he wants partners in creation. He wants other, other people in creation, he wants a relationship with that which he has created. And he does that through us. But I want to just draw your attention to something. There's grass everywhere. There are people, male and female, he created them. There's waters above and waters below. And in this first love story, God has so loved the world and so loved us that he gets us to be a people who go out and live in creation in a way that rules over it and brings it brings it to submission, okay? Important. Because now I want to tell you the second love story in the Bible, okay? And I got more flowers for you. Next slide. Oh, yeah, so yeah, right here. The second love story. Let's take a look. Now, some of you are going to say, well, Pastor Brad, this is just the story of Adam and, right? It's not. It's the story of Adam and the woman. You'll notice that her naming is the most important part of the story. It's most, the, the biggest kind of revelation that happens in the whole thing. In fact, this story is really about naming, and I want to kind of walk you through what it says. As we kind of walk in it, I do remind you, um, it tells you very clearly in 2.5, uh, next slide, that there's no shrub on the earth, no humans yet, waters aren't coming down from the sky, they're bubbling up from the ground, but no rain yet, Dust is gathered and breathed into, and then God makes Eden, okay? It's a second creation story, a second story of love. It does not go with the story before it. It is different than the story before it. So in this story, what happens, and, and the reason it's here is very important, because if all things are created good and in the image of God, what went wrong? Like, does anybody else see how messed up things are? Right? It seems kind of off the rails. This next story is going to talk about things being all messed up, okay, and how it got that way, perhaps, right? But to get a better view of the reality, you have to have both stories. If you just tell the story of the world being all messed up and people are just horrible, I'm looking out at some of you, and some of you, y'all are kind of nice, Y'all aren't bad folk just in and of yourself, right? You got some goodness in you. Well, okay, so are we over here? Well, no, maybe we're over. No, you have to have both stories side by side to make any sense of it, right? It tells you a deeper truth, okay? But let's kind of talk about this, what happens. So just so I can show you the story, what happens is there's just kind of a, a, a big kind of, we're told there's just this, big earth and dust. There's no shrubs yet. There's no rain yet. Uh, so it looks like my backyard, right? And then what happens is you you push together all of the mud. And you know what uh, Adama means, right? It's just mud, okay? Mud man. And it means man. And then literally we're told that he breathes into the nostrils uh, and Adam comes to life. 
Okay, and that's how humanity is made, is that God kind of breathes into them there, right? And so as that happens, um, then God makes a place for Adam to work called Eden. And you see this is in verse 8 and 9. So has anybody ever watched the love story show called The Bachelor? Right? Adam is the original Bachelor, Okay, he's he's there. Now, I know some of y'all, it's a guilty pleasure and you don't want to confess or admit that you've actually ever seen the show and that kind of stuff. But but let's kind of go through and talk about the attributes of this bachelor and how, how blessed he is. Friends, he has a good job right on slide 17. Next slide. Uh, he is taking care of, of God's stuff, God's garden. I mean, how much more impressive do you get than that? Uh, he has all the food you could want literally everything you could possibly imagine and the only rule in his work is just one thing i mean friends i got books of manuals of what i can do and what i can't do and i got people who help me stay out of trouble to make sure i comply to those manuals right i can't imagine just having one rule and what's the one rule do not eat the fruit of the tree of good and evil the knowledge of good and evil, right? You're not allowed to eat that one tree. You can have everything else because we all know that it's a great idea to take your two toddler grandchildren or nephews and nieces, put them in a room, take a cookie jar, set it in front of them and say, no matter what you do, don't eat. How does that go, right? But here we are. We're not to two yet. We're just still at the one. But I mean, he's a pretty good bachelor. But God sees that it is good is not good for Adam or man, the man, to be alone and wants to make him a suitable helper. So here's where it becomes. Remember when I said the story's about naming? It's fascinating what happens. And friends, I should have memorized my Hebrew vocabulary better. I can say goats. Uh, that's about it in Hebrew. Uh, my animals are not very good, but I should have memorized more of those so I could just rattle them off, all the names he would have said. But literally what God does is you can see God over in the other side of creation, like making a little animal, like here's a dove, and then he brings it to Adam. Can this be your helper? Thank God he said no, right? Um, and, and there he keeps going back and forth and back and forth with all these animals, but he lets Adam name those animals okay it's a story of naming and then after finding no suitable helper we're told told that a sleep is made to fall over adam and he goes to sleep right and here in slide 18 a man put to was put to sleep and a rib is taken and the woman is fashioned from his missing rib and in the next slide 19 this, you know, Adam is smitten at, at first sight. He sees the woman made out of his ribs. And somehow it's, it's kind of interesting. You're going to see this a lot in this particular love story. Apparently, they know things that were said, the characters do, when they weren't there, right? Because Adam was asleep when she was formed out of him, right? But somehow in his, his speaking, he knows this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because it literally means out of man, uh, for she was taken out of the man. And the narrator goes on to explain that is why a man leaves his father and mother and unites to his wife, and they become one flesh. And in fact, the verb there in Hebrew is devak. It literally is like a, uh, if you've ever been out into West Texas where they'll have like an oak tree that's been overgrown by a bunch of vines, and you can't see where one starts and one finishes, but they're all kind of intertwined and you couldn't separate the two. That's what the word is here. So um, that's kind of the understanding. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Okay. So it's a fascinating story that brings us to this point of kind of understanding the love of God is providing for that which he created. He has a relationship with creation itself and all who are created in it. And it seems to be, from my way of understanding, a very compassionate and caring, intentional relationship for this man that he has created. He has made a job. He's provided a place 
and now he's given a helper to be that person's mate. It's a fascinating kind of walk. Now, I have a little slide here that might cause you a little pain in the brain. The next one on, next slide, yeah. What, was there a design flaw? All right, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. And he asks Eve, you know, uh, she's not Eve, I'm sorry, to ask the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, how does the woman know what God did or didn't say? Who did God give the command to? Adam. So kind of curious how she was supposed to know what she never heard, right? Did God deceive Adam and the woman? Like, is there some sort sort of trickery there? And this is back to what I said. I mean, what kind of parent, what kind of grandparent puts the cookie jar in the middle of the toddlers, expecting them not to eat? You know, there's a guy, Amen, uh, at, uh, he taught at MIT, did mathematics, and then later would go on to Jerusalem University, and I read a lot of his work. The thing that really fascinates me about him was he he did a lot of game theory and uh, teaching about big numbers and how they work and stuff. But what was really awesome in his work is he just he just said like if there are only two choices in the garden and it's an infinite amount of time, eventually if they have free will they're going to make the wrong choice. It's mathematically impossible in the regression for that not to occur. It's going to happen. So what's up with that? We have to ask that question. Uh, it's there. And then we have these beautiful kind of discussions. Did God uh, deceive? The food was too good not to taste. We're told the description in ch verse 6 is amazing. They realize they're naked. But I want you to hear in 21, right, the kind of questions that are asked. And my mom and dad were on the Zoom earlier this morning, and um, it was kind of weird having my own parents there because many times I heard them ask me, Brad, where are you? Right? Anybody been asked that by their folks? Where were you is often how it was asked. Brad, who told you that about yourself? Right? Have you ever said that to somebody? Like, where did you hear that? Where did, oh, even better. Where did you learn how to say that word, Brad, when I was a kid? Y'all faced up with that, right? And this one, have you done what I told you not to do, right? All of these are words parents say to children. All of them are common to the human experience. The people writing down these stories are keen observers of human nature and the world they're in. And through everything they're putting down in this story, they're trying to point you to a God who loves you in a personal and intimate way, a God who was beyond the creation that was made, yet openly desires and seek to, seeks to be in relationship with each one of you. You see, you deserve a flower. A rose, something to remind you of God's love being with you from the beginning. So I think I have it here in slide 22 for you, right? The children respond. Slide 22, next one. And it's as you would expect when mom and dad say, Brad, where were you? Well, I was where you told me to go doing what you told me to do. It's their fault, right? What does Adam say? The woman you put here with me. It's her fault, God. But he's really saying, God, it's your fault. Why I got in this trouble. And so then God goes to the woman, and what does the woman do? It was the serpent. You know how crafty he is? He's craftier than all the other animals. It's his fault. And then God curses them all the serpent, the woman, and the man, Adam. And so let's take a closer look at that in chapter three. He picks up, and we'll pick up at the woman in verse 16. He says, to the woman, he said, 
I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to the man he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. Like, boom, punishment, right? They're getting what they deserve, right? God gives them work. Huh. What? Does anybody get their identity from what they do? Has anybody been blessed to be able to do work? Like what kind of God creates a punishment that also blesses? Anybody ever been in love with another human being and joined together in a marriage? to try to make two into one? I mean, what kind of God punishes people with a marriage relationship? A God with a good sense of humor, right? Some of y'all have been married to those people. Yeah, right. <laughs> and what kind of God creates a punishment that involves giving birth to children and bringing a blessing to new generations. Like, what's up with that? It's kind of strange. And then, in case that wasn't enough, the naming story reaches its pinnacle, its most important point. And now it's time for a new name. So, Adam, our next slide, our original bachelor, is here. He's been thrown out of his job and fired. He's been kicked out of his house. His stuff is thrown out on the street. He gets no more food and is hungry. And the woman he blames for it is right there with him. And he looks at her and he says, you horrible. No. No. What does he say? He names her Eve. Up to that point, she's always referred to as the woman. He names her Eve, giver of all life. Wow. Wow. You see, he sees the blessing. He knows what is going on. I there's a there's a part of this that's so kind of un kind of done, and that is, huh. We're in the image and likeness of God. In that earlier story, it said he created them, male and female, together in the image of God. Maybe it takes the relationship between both to be the image of God. Maybe it takes the relationship of families. Maybe it takes the relationship of tribes. Maybe it takes the agape love to all humanity and us looking beyond our self-interest, but coming together in love to fulfill the image of God that is in each one of us from the beginning. You see, the love of God is in creation, or even in the very choice of it. God chose to be in relationship even with us. And whatever you carried in here today, and no matter what you felt about yourself, friends, these flowers, they're for you. If you need one, to remind you that indeed God loves you and is with you in whatever you're going through, take one with you. Um, if you leave one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it on uh, Judy's desk for doing all the great work to make this possible. But let's make some of this, uh, this real. Uh, slide 24. 
as we make this real, I just want to remind you of what I just said. You are made in the image of God. Living like it really matters. Um, keeping hold of it when the world and people in it, and sometimes even the people closest to us, try to tell us we're not. Hold on to it. Second, uh, do you believe that God loves you? And how does that love make a difference in how you live? I think reflecting on that question can really help you as you kind of journey through and navigate the trials in life. And then how have you seen what seemed like God's curses becoming a blessing in your life or experience? I think that that second creation story isn't the only place where we think God's a God of punishment only to realize that that detour on the way is the greatest blessing our life could have ever received. So I hope it's a blessing to you. I would encourage you to reflect on those questions. And now I will jump off and take any, and uh, thank y'all. Take any questions you got. Yeah. Uh, we're going to try to use, well, can we use the microphone, Kevin, the, the handheld? Yeah, so if you'll use this and then pass it to the next person that raised their, their hand, that way I don't have to repeat all the questions. So it has occurred to me that in and of itself, having the knowledge of good and evil does not seem like an intrinsically bad thing. Um, and interestingly enough, the serpent said, you shall be like God. Yep. knowing good and evil mm -hmm. and being like God also does yeah. not seem to be an inherently bad thing. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts or maybe the commentaries that you've read as to what's going on there? Would that be a permanent prohibition or was it just that this was not the time for them to be mm. delving into that matter? Oh, what, what a great question was it was uh, so <laughs> There's lots of times in the Bible where I wonder, is this, I think with the word we would use, axiom, is it for all times and in all places, or was it a prohibition for that point? Well, if you can find the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you can get there, don't eat it. I mean, that, that would be my my, my caution, uh, cautionary tale. I, I would say for me, the story is very metaphorical, um, so it's it would be hard for me to take it um uh, literal in, in that. I, I think what it is pointing out, though, that's that's difficult or a challenge is going to be this this issue with how do we how do we wrestle with our humility? And is there an element to which this is how much are we willing to let God do the difficult part in our lives? Um, I think there's a real temptation for us to prize human action over divine action. And I think there's a real temptation for us to try to, um, to try to let hubris guide our way. Um, how to say, was it Lord Byron wrote that poem? Um, uh, you know, look, you know, look on your works, great as, was it, I can't ever say that name, as, as Matthias and despair, right? Because uh, the things he had built over time had become a wasteland. And um, I just can't help but wonder, like, um, how often, you know, I mean, to put it in a psalm, Psalm 146 is going to talk about don't put your trust in princes or the ways of this world, because when they perish, their plans all go to nothing. Okay, so like, like, do we put our, our lives, our trust, and our hope in temporary things or in things that are permanent? I want to be careful to talk, though, about knowledge as if it's the tree there. I, I don't think I, I wouldn't want to make any allegories to like science versus faith and that kind of stuff. I think that would be way overblown and not what the text intended. I, I think the text was really just talking about um, knowing um, good and bad. To say, so did God intend for things to be good or bad? I think it's a real question. Um, Wesley is going to do a sermon that I'd, I'd recommend y'all to read. I mean, I might do it sometime for you. Uh, so if you hear it on a Sunday, don't get too mad at me if I'm uh, just uh, plagiarizing Wesley. I'll give him credit for it, I promise. Uh, but it's called uh, God's Love to Fallen Man. And um, it has a line in it that goes something like this. How 
Oh, how sweet and wonderful was the fall of Adam, for greater was made known the love of God by the mercy on full display of a God who went about redeeming the world. Okay? I mean, that's a paraphrase, so don't hold me to it if I didn't quote it exactly. But, but, but what he's arguing, and in this uh, sermon, why it's important and I can remember it, is because he asked that 10,000 be distributed upon his death. So it was the thing he wanted people to know and know from him. But what he was saying is that, is that kind of this understanding of God's, God's kind of love and love in the world and love as an idea isn't fully known without forgiveness being part of it. And that it's actually a better world because of what's unfolded and love is richer than that. Now, some of you I know would say, well, we'd rather be automatons without any pain. <laughs> and uh, uh, we would rather go back, but I don't know. I think I think uh, I'd rather have free will and liberty, and um, and allow God's love to be made known through the good and the bad. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Are there other questions? That's a great question. Yeah, you hand it back to Russ. I don't even need this or not? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's really it's, for the people on Zoom. It helps them. This is. I hope I don't get struck down by lightning on the way home. Yeah. If if we're made in God's image. But we know we're imperfect. Uh -huh. Does that mean God's imperfect? We've gone from Old yeah. Testament punishment was the key and, and rules. And now we're in the New Testament of love and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Is that a mistake by God? Was oh. that planned by God? <laughs> right, right. Uh, That's I don't. It's yeah, it's a, that, I, I can I, let, let me work through through, uh, through that with you, Rose. That's great. Um, so, so just to make sure I, I understand the core of your question, um, if we're if we're imperfect and we're made in the image of likeness in God, is God imperfect? Um, well, well, no. I mean, I don't think we would say God's imperfect. Um, I would say the the author of chapter two of uh, Genesis. I'm not going to say they're imperfect. I'm just going to say I wish they had given us a lot more to work with <laughs> because our questions through the centuries have there's more of them, and and it, it comes back to that. I, I would say though this. I would say um, don't underestimate how cosmically significant the sin of Adam and Eve was. It was more than just eating an apple, and it was it went deeper into the fabric of the universe than a simple um, action. Okay, it, it it breaks things on a cosmic scale, and that's pretty universally hold held by most Christian thinkers. So I'm in good stead um, in that that claim. It goes pretty deep, um, and and here it's going to be in Paul. Paul's going to talk about how sin entered creation um, through uh, one person, and then a little bit after that, he'll talk about how uh, you know, the the scripture we just read this week about the the inward groaning and longing of creation as it's giving birth to something new to reveal the children of God, right? So so there's something about creation that's broken. So Wesley, in another sermon, in the, the scripture way of salvation, is going to try to deal with it like this. He's going to talk about in what ways are we in the image of God. It's also part of this. You can get You can get one list out of the image of God, there's another list in the scripture way of salvation, and you can kind of look at both of those. But he kind of says, like, how are we in the image of God? Like, what are our innate kind of capacities? And for him, I'm going to just paraphrase a couple. Uh, there's There were five, but um, gosh, I, I know what I prepared, and I, I didn't prepare this part. So you're getting an answer afterwards. So I might be able to get two or three. So, um, But one of them would be being able to know if something was good or bad, being able to know if something was true or false being able to actually have agency to act on something. And in most philosophy, these would be the three that would be allowed to be used. Um, there's a few more Wesley will give, and, and they're important for different reasons, but let me just stick to those three. And wh what, what Wesley's going to argue is that it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we're all able to know right from wrong or good from bad. It's by the power of the Holy Spirit to restore in us the difference between truth and falsehood that lets us have good actions in the world and make a difference. So, you know, if you've got a friend who's an atheist and they do something that's good and you know it's good, it's okay because the Holy Spirit's working on them too, right? Trying them to get it, get them to do right from you know and good. But the Holy Spirit is working on us, trying to restore us and woo us toward good action all the time in Wesley. And so, like, 
I'm going to say as far as our belief about God, um, God is um, God is always in the parental position. But as an older parent now, and I know how messed up I am, is God messed up too? I don't. I don't think so. I think it's a good question. Uh, but but there are some things. There's the reason I hesitate not just to say heck no. That's just way out there. Is because there's some part. I mean, like the Noah story we're about to get to in Genesis. Like what's up with that? He leaves him on the boat up there to just floating around, and he, we're told all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, he remembered <laughs> that he was out there. Like, I don't want a God who forgets, right? And stuff like that. Now, the other thing I want to kind of talk about in what you said that I think is also really important now, and I, and I hope I was shattering it just a little bit in my presentation about um, the story, commonly called the story of Adam and Eve, but now I think I'll call it Adam and the woman. It just makes it more dramatic sounding. Um but in Adam and the woman's story, the 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 part about it that's kind of um, hard to wrap my mind around is the kind of um, the kind of movement of God in it that brings brings humanity back together and and just doesn't quit like loving people, like so it's it's a weird story and that it's very paternal, but at the same time the love of God is so perfect that even in the discipline of God, it's there. So what I was trying to do in showing that very clearly is to say we have a kind of a myth that Jesus never had judgment or um, challenge to us and how we lived our daily lives, but that's really not true when we read all the red letters. Some of the things he says are pretty harsh and pretty pretty judging, right? And likewise, we, we kind of will separate and say, well, the Old Testament is where all the rules were, and yeah, I mean, gosh, I can forgive us for Leviticus, you know, it's it's in there, you know, and everything's detailed. However, um, but a lot of uh, a lot of uh, even in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, you get a lot of grace and love and expressions of God's love, and in Genesis especially, when we get to the story of Abraham that we'll get to in our love stories of this uh, storge, this family love, he goes there. The other thing I'm trying to do in this a little bit, or was trying to do today, and I I, I got it across some, but I, I don't know that I got it across enough, is um, to shatter the idea, though, that um, one one gender or sex was made um, superior or different from the other, but instead were two parts of the same whole. Because we've got a lot to answer for as the church and the way that the Bible's been used incorrectly to treat certain pe- groups of people as if they're not fully human. And we need to, like, shatter that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm going to have roses every week. And so I got, I got different people for each week. But this week would be Judy afterwards, but don't tell her because it was supposed to be a surprise. They gave it away at the early one. But if you need one, come get one because I, I want people to, if the, you need something to hold on to, we had a couple of people come get one at the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah. So, having read this, I don't know how many times, it struck me that good and evil pre-existed the creation of the world. Yeah, golly, you know, I don't know what to, it it certainly does, because the tree is the knowledge of that, and it's there, but, you know, is it better to know or better to not know? Like that, that's a, just a kind of a, an, an interesting question. I think it's better to know, but sometimes it feels better to not know. Well, the theory that I've wrapped my mind around uh-huh. is that there was actually a earth before this Genesis earth. Okay. Right. And that's where the fallen angels happened. Okay. So, well, but boy, so, I wish it said it. It's obvious before man was created, right? Good and evil already existed. Yeah. If I, God I, only existed, then hmm. there was no evil. Right. So, so God pre-exists. You have you have to answer the question of how did evil come into the world. I find I I want to be careful not to go beyond what the text says. So I that's a that's an interesting theory. I but I'm not willing to like hang my hat on those things because yeah, it's just a theory. But 
but uh, in what the text actually says, that I mean, it's 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 what any monotheist has to kind of wrestle with at some point. Um, if God is so good, why is life not sometimes? Right, you have to kind of answer that question, and I, I think the Bible does. And I think the route it kind of primarily goes is that there is evil in the world, and there is um, it's part of it's part of the fallen creation, waiting redemption. Yeah. Right. So, so uh, traditionally, Christianity. Um, has has not had a problem with knowledge. I mean, like we we create universities, we make hospitals, we do lots of things for knowledge. Um, uh, so, I find it uh, fascinating that uh, you know, kind of in some modern times, uh, uh, that's been a been a weird thing, like the Scopes trial here in America and different things. This kind of idea that somehow tr any truth about the world that can be discovered would somehow be against God or biblical truth, right? So if we believe in, in the God described in Scripture, I mean, I don't have any problem with anything that's true, right? I'm desperate to know it. So I love all the nerdy stuff, especially, oh, I mean, like the uh, all these space telescopes. Oh, my gosh, I'm watching like every discovery, seeing every little thing, because it's just exploring the great the greatness of God's cosmos. I want to know everything about, I mean, like, gosh, they found a planet the other day that might have water on it, like, I want to go, you know, like it would take, it's way too far away, but anyway, it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. So I, I love learning about all that, but for me, um, I, you know, anything that reflects truth that is actually true um, will reflect God and God's glory in the world. I mean, I, I just think that's just, it's just the nature of the world we're in. So I, I don't, I don't personally have a problem with it. Scripture doesn't tend to have a problem with knowledge. Um, it has a problem with hubris. And it does over and over again. It has it has a problem with human characteristics that break the relationship between us and creation. And I try to say that word relationship as much as y'all could possibly bear me repeating it over and over and over again, because to me it is all about being in relationship with creation. And the great thing is, as God chose to be in relationship, is known in relationship, and that relationship, I believe, in love is most fully known. But if we're going to talk about love stories, love stories are relationships. So, great questions. Are there others? Any Zoom questions? All right, I don't see any. Okay, yeah. They, I asked if there's any questions and two people dropped off. <laughs> I was like, I thought that was funny. Well, good, I'm going to shut it down. I'll, I'll come sit over here for just a minute.